Hi there, my name is William Morgan, and I'm one of the creators of Linkerd. This is the introduction to Linkerd and state of the project talk at KubeCon NA 2020 virtual. I'm going to be joined by my fellow Linkerd person, Tarun Pothalapati. He's going to tell you about the Linkerd 2.8 release, the very fresh Linkerd 2.9 release, and our plans for 2.10 and beyond. By the way, Tarun started his Linkerd journey as a Google Summer of Code student, and now he holds the illustrious title of Linkerd maintainer. So hopefully he'll tell you a little bit about that. But before that, I'm going to give you an introduction to Linkerd, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Tarun. So here we are. What is Linkerd? Linkerd is a service mesh. Hopefully that's a term that you have heard before, uh, but it's okay if you haven't because I'm going to tell you what that means. Linkerd is known as an ultra light and ultra fast and security first service mesh. And I'll go into details for each of those aspects of Linkerd. A very healthy community. Uh, of uh, adopters and contributors, of which you are now officially members. By watching this talk, you are now part of the Linkerd community. So welcome. It's very nice to have you here. Uh, over four years in production, a uh, Slack channel with 5,000 members in it, uh, very helpful and friendly members, uh, all sorts of GitHub stars and, and contributors. And of course, we're hosted by the CNCF. Uh, all sorts of fancy logos up here. Two, uh, two logos up here uh, not, that are not up here that probably should be uh, because we have two very exciting end user talks at this very conference. One is a keynote by Dave Sudia of GoSpotCheck where he talks about how he uses Linkerd and other CNCF projects uh, to build a developer platform uh, at GoSpotCheck. So definitely uh, go watch that talk. Uh, and then another exciting talk from Justin Turner and Garrett Griffin at HEB talking about how they rolled Linkerd out to production in order to accelerate the delivery of their curbside checkout. HEB is a grocery store in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So Linkerd is not just a cool project. It can actually help people, uh, you know, get their groceries as part of the pandemic. So that is really exciting for us. Be sure to take out those, uh, check out those two talks. Um, so let's get back to Linkerd. What does Linkerd do? So as a service mesh, we bucket these features uh, into kind of three categories. Linkerd gives you a bunch of observability features, a bunch of reliability features, and a bunch of security features. And there's some nice screenshots here of the cool dashboards that we have uh, as well. And what's interesting about the service mesh, in my mind, is that it's not that these are new features that we've never had before, it's that what the service mesh does, what Linkerd does, is it gives you these features at the platform level. So rather than having the developers have to implement things like TLS or retries or uh, um, timeouts uh, or metrics, um, of course, they still have to do some of that, right? The, uh, there, there's still a component to reliability and security and observability that cannot be done by the service mesh. But rather than the service, the developers having to own all of that, they can now get those features at the platform level. So that's what Linkerd provides. It moves those features out of the hands of the developers and down to the platform where they belong. And Linkerd, of course, focuses on being very light and being very simple. So why should you care? Well, in my mind, you should care because what Linkerd does is it gives you, the platform owners, the Kubernetes adopters, the SREs, gives you some primitives around observability and security and reliability that you need. You need these things if you're building a cloud native application. And it does it in a way, like I said, that gives you no developer involvement. So it's not really about solving technical problems so much as solving socio-technical problems. It's going to give you the control and ownership over your own destiny. Sounds great. OK, let's talk a little bit about Linkerd's design philosophy. In short, I would say this is uh, do as little as possible. Right, so Linkerd should just work out of the box. You should be able to add Linkerd to a functioning Kubernetes application, and the application should continue functioning. Okay, sounds great. Actually, pretty hard to do. Uh, it should consume as m a minimum of resource costs. Right, so memory, CPU consumption should be as small as possible. The latency that it adds to your application, of course, should be as small as possible too. And there's all sorts of uh, cool engineering that we do in order to accomplish that. It should be simple, 
So you as the operator of Linkerd should not have to wrestle with a thousand configuration options and a whole bunch of new YAML and, and so on. You've just adopted Kubernetes. It's already very complicated. You shouldn't have to adopt a whole new level of complication. And Linkerd should have security enabled out of the box on by default. And that's the big headline feature of 2.9 uh, around mutual TLS, but uh, I'll leave that for Tarun. So we have a control plane that's written in Go, sits in a Kubernetes namespace. We have a very cool data plane written in Rust, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about, called Linkerd2-proxy. Uh, and I have you know uh, some background reading here, if you feel like hearing about some of the history um, in the big uh, kind of rewrite from Linkerd v1 to v2. All right, so just briefly, Linkerd architecture, like most service meshes, there is a control plane and there's a data plane. The control plane is a bunch of components that sit off to the side and give you control and visibility into the data plane. And the data plane is a set of proxies. Those proxies are deplo deployed as sidecar containers, which means they sit in the same pod as your application containers. And Linkerd does all the magic to make the TCP connections to your to and from your application components go through those proxies so that the proxy can handle all the fancy stuff that it needs to handle. It can initiate and terminate TLS and, and, and uh, change HTTP 1 to HTTP 2 and so on. Uh, and ideally that happens under the scenes without your developers being aware of it, without them even having to know that Linkerd is there. Now, you might have noticed in that diagram that there are two proxies that we've added in between every single hop. So that means those proxies have got to be really, really fast uh, and really, really lightweight because you might have a whole lot of them. Uh, so we have invested a, a, a whole lot of time and energy into what we call our micro proxy, which is a Linkerd data plane called Linkerd2 proxy. It's a critical part of the system. Many service meshes are built on Envoy. We're not, we're built on this very dedicated service mesh proxy, which allows us to be extremely fast, extremely low memory, and extremely secure. So by writing this in Rust, we avoid a whole class of memory vulnerabilities that are endemic to C and C++. Uh, we can be you know, just as fast as the machine will let us be. Uh, of course, we're audited uh, thanks to CNCF. We have regular third-party security audits, um, which we pass. Uh, and Linkerd2 proxy is built on this ultra modern asynchronous network stack. So all of the really interesting asynchronous network programming kind of development is all happening in the Rust world today. Uh, so if that kind of thing is exciting to you, then please check out the repo. Everything is open source, of course, Apache v2, 100% audited, 100% awesome. So that's Linkerd2-proxy. Here's a little snippet from uh, the security audit um, of course, the full audit is uh, in the repo itself. A typically excellent code readability, careful choice of implementation languages. Uh, yeah, it was a good report. Okay, uh, <laughs> we actually have a newer version of these numbers. Unfortunately, that newer version was not available in time for me to record this. Uh, but if you search for Kinvoke Linkerd benchmarks, you should find a whole bunch of open source benchmark frameworks and results talking about how expensive it is to run Linkerd. And the answer is, well, it's more expensive than not having a service mesh, uh, but it is a lot faster and a lot smaller uh, than other service mesh alternatives. Istio is the one we like to pick on because that's the one that everyone knows about. Linkerd is much, much faster and much, much smaller. But do your own research, check out those results, uh, and then finally, you know, I said we were going to pick on Istio uh, a little bit, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I'll, I'll be around during the Q&A period for this. Um, in my mind, because this is such a common one, I, I want to address it up front. I think it comes down to what do you need in a service mesh? So, uh, you know, both Istio and Linkerd provide very, very similar uh, value props. They both provide these security and observability and reliability features. Um, but there's a very different focus between the two projects. Istio is extremely uh, uh, feature rich and uh, works in many, many different environments under many, many different situations. Linkerd, <coughs> Linkerd is very focused on uh, doing the bare minimum. So we are very focused on the Kubernetes use case and we're very focused on making it so that if you want the power of the service mesh, you actually don't have to do any configuration 
at all, at least certainly not to get started. And we'll do as much out of the box for you by default. Of course, that doesn't mean we're hiding things away from you. We're also very focused on visibility and introspection. So at every point, you know exactly what Linkerd is doing and you can understand the state of the mesh um, as, uh, as well as how it's helping your applications. Okay, so lots more to be said on this, obviously, but at this point, I am going to turn it over to my fellow Linkerd person, Tarun Pothalapati, who's going to tell you a little bit about what has been cooking in the Linkerd kitchen uh, and what is coming soon. So take it away, Tarun. Thank you, William. Hello, everyone. My name is Tarun and I'm one of the maintainers of the Linkerd project. In today's my part of the session, I'll try to cover the current roadmap of the project. Uh, and also the current state of the Linkerd project and, and also the future roadmap. So first we'll start with the 2.8 release, which, I, which added support for multi-cluster. Uh, this means that you can have applications across clusters talking to each other in, in a secure manner. This is possible by adding a new component called the multi-cluster gateway that acts like an entry point into your cluster. Uh, for, and all the, all the communication from other clusters will flow through. This has the following goals. So it, uh, it expects a unified trust domain that is validated across all cluster, uh, across clusters during, during communication. There is no single point of failure, which means that uh, even if a cluster goes down, it does not affect the service, the multi-cluster functionality, but uh, for your application, you can use things like traffic split, etc., to fail over onto other clusters, etc. Applications on other clusters. Uh, it, it also does not have a requirement on the networking primitive that the cluster uses. So the, so you can have these, this feature in, in environments like the private environments, VPCs or on the open internet. It also builds on the same unified in cluster communication model, which means that all your metrics, traffic splits, primitives like traffic splits, etc., service profiles will work out of the box. Next, uh, 2.8 release also, also has a ton of other improvements around Helm, the installation way, etc. Uh, next, we'll talk about the current latest release, the 2.9. 2.9. Uh, if you're, if you, uh, by the time you're watching this talk, the release would have already gone out. So feel free to try that out and, and give us feedback. So, f so the flagship feature is TCP MTLS and load balancing, which means that not only your HTTP requests, all your TCP connections will be MTLS and load balanced out of the box without any extra configuration. The, this has been one of the requested features. Uh, so we also added support for ARM64, which means that you can run the here, like the control plane and the proxies on ARM64 devices like the Raspberry Pi, etc. Now, we also added support for bring your own promises, which means that previously, whenever you install, even now, whenever you install Linkerd, you have you, Linkerd gets its own promises, which is used to power the dashboards, the CLA, etc. We are trying to make it easy to use your own Prometheus that you already have in your environment so that the control plane, etc., can talk to your Prometheus to power the dashboards, etc. Uh, we also made it made the existing Linkerd Prometheus more configurable so that you can have things like remote write, etc. configurations on the on the Linkerd Prometheus. We also added support for service topologies. Service topologies is a relatively new feature in Kubernetes that allows you to have node topology aware load balancing. So, for example, if you have, if a client is connecting to a to a service, uh, it should probably talk to the so the part on the same node or at least on the same availability zone so that the latencies are lower rather than some other some other one. So if you have service topologies configured with that information, Linkerd will take that information into account whenever it's taking a load balancing decision. Will make to so as to have a latency aware so that to have a uh, less latency. Uh, so we also did a foundational change on how we store state and retrieve it during upgrade. So essentially previously as Linkerd is being adopted more widely. It has been a problem to add more configurations, etc., specific to environments, etc. So we, we, so we, we, we made it easy to add more configuration options without having to change at mul change things at multiple places, for, so that you can have more configurations on Linkerd. Link 2.9 release also has a ton of other improvements around multi-cluster, multi-threading in the proxy, and support for endpoint slices. The 2.9 release is a is a very tightly packed release and I'll highly recommend you to check out the release notes to understand the scale of this release. Next, we'll talk about the 2.10 and beyond. So, so first, obviously, we'll, we'll work on the server speaks first protocol, which means that for applications like MySQL, etc., where the server speaks first rather than the client, it's hard for the proxy to, to do protocol detection and to do MTLS on top. So what we're planning to do is to have a way for the to for the user to configure things so that the proxy can 
configure that it's a server speaks first protocol so, and so that the proxy can act accordingly we'll also be adding support for multi-cluster tcp which means that not only http connections can flow through the multi-cluster gateway but also all kinds of tcp connections that, and it is and they are mtls obviously uh, with, with both of the above changes done what we can do is to man we can mandate tls by default in your cluster so what it means that Tinkerd expects you to have some configuration to tell you that to to tell Linkerd that there is some conf, some communication that you don't want MTL list. So it so it means that by default all all your message applications all the all if if you if all the applications in your cluster are missed it essentially means that you have TLS by default everywhere, which is awesome for security and auditing purposes. Obviously, uh, we'll also be having an inc, uh, minimal control plane install. So. Uh, so what we're trying to do is that uh, even though the Linkerd components right now can work independently, the installation package is a bit tightly packed to allow you to do that. So what we're trying to do is that to have to break up these components into modules that you can independently install and incrementally install. So for example, first you would start with the core control plane that consists of the proxy injector, the destination service, the identity service, and then you can incrementally install things like the dashboard on top. So uh, this this makes the installation installation approach more simpler and also more flexible based on your environment, etc. Uh, we'll also be doing authorization uh, authorization, obviously. So which means that to, you want to have a way to configure policies on which service can access which other service and which service should not access which other services. Essentially, uh, we'll be adding we'll be adding a new 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 primitive around those lines to make it possible to configure allow and deny rules based on that. We'll, we are also planning to have standardized APIs and add-on framework. So, so it is as uh, so what a service mesh allows to be built on top using its APIs is uh, is very important. So things like Flagger, which does canary deployments, all the service mesh interface, uh, etc., are built using the APIs that a service mesh provides. So uh, to uh, to add additional functionality like an agent that reacts to golden metrics and emits events and things like that, you want to have a standardized API on the on the on the service mesh so we are trying to make the api more standardized so that it is easier for more developers to add to add to build agents uh, and other things on top and we are also planning to have an add-on framework that makes it easy to to use that that makes it easy to have additional components installed together along uh, along with the along with the li li linkerd install like agar etc uh, one of the we are we'll obviously have a lot of other plans around WebAssembly plugins, etc. As more and more of these use cases and feature requests pop up, we'll try to prioritize based on that and and have um, all, all these roadmaps are available as issues in the project. And if you have if you are interested on any of them, you should definitely check them out or raise an issue if you are interested in a specific use case and we can figure there out. As it's a planned roadmap, keep in mind that it can change. So next we'll talk about the getting involved side of things. So I'll I'll tell my story first. So like, like an year ago, I was a CNCF intern at working on LinkedIn on various bug fixes on the SMI project, etc. And then I have been kept contributing on it. Now, I, now I'm one of the maintain of the project, which is awesome, I guess. So if you're interested in contributing to the project, we are more than help you help help having you and help you and help you get started. Uh, contributing to a pro open source project not just implies that you have to write code there are like hundred different things that, that you could do a project for example you can write a blog post on a specific problem that you that you that you faced during the install and blog about it so that other users can can take note uh, i'm sure a lot of users would fall into the same problem uh, we have a very active slack community where not just the maintainers but also but also the, the users ask questions and also answers and also answer answers between themselves uh, all our development activity happens on github uh, using issues and uh, using issues and uh, discussions feature we also send mailing lists etc uh, about the project updates etc we also have monthly community calls where where we where we provide an update on what's been what's been what's been cooking in the project and also take user feedback questions uh, if you are interested we are more than happy to help you get started thank you